God bless you. God bless you. This evening we are wrapping our our nearly two month series on kingdom culture, and I I didn't necessarily expect or anticipate this series to last more than a few weeks, but nevertheless, here we are. Nevertheless, here we are, and as He oftentimes does, God had His own plans and His own agenda, and I'm absolutely on board with that. I pray that you have been blessed up to this point by this series, and I would encourage you to go back and to listen through through this series as time permits. As we prepare to close out 2023, as time permits, I, I would encourage you to go back, whether it's listening on the way to work or on your lunch break or when you have an opportunity in the morning or in the evening, to go back and to listen through this sermon series on kingdom culture. And I don't believe that it's by by accident, I don't believe it's by happenstance or coincidence that God saw fit for our church to end the year in a seven-week series on kingdom culture. I, d- I don't think that that's by mistake or just by, by coincidence. There are a number of ways that we could have wrapped this year. There are a number of sermon series. There are a number of topics that we could have talked about or discussed. But God saw fit for us to end this year immersed or submerged, so to speak, in kingdom culture. And I don't claim by, by any means to understand the comprehensive totality of who God is. I don't, I don't by any means claim to be smart enough to, to understand the magnitude and the complexities of God. I don't, I don't by any means profess to have all of the answers to all of the questions. But I know this to be true. I know that God doesn't waste his word. I can't give you all the answers to all the questions that you may have about or surrounding the mysteries of the gospel. I I can't explain to you the power or the magnitude of, of who God is with this feeble mind of mine. But the one thing that I know to be true is that God doesn't waste his word. This I know to be true, that when God speaks, he speaks with intention. And when God speaks, he speaks with purpose. And sometimes when God speaks, he speaks with the intent to encourage or to edify. Other times when God speaks, he speaks with the purpose to to challenge us or to convict us. Other times when God speaks, he he speaks a word of warning or a word of caution. But regardless of the motivation, regardless of the intent behind God's words, I can rest assured that when God speaks, he commands the attention of the audience that he's speaking to. God goes as far as to say in Isaiah 55 that so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, that it shall not return to me void or it shall not return unto me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and it shall prosper and for which the thing that I sent it to do. Here's what God's word is. God's word is a seed that is obligated to produce. That's what the word of God is. God's word is a seed that is obligated to produce. And that's why God doesn't waste his words, because anything that flows from his mouth is required to produce. God's lips have the capacity to manufacture the invisible into the tangible. That's who he is. That's the capacity and and the magnitude and the power and the omniscience and, and the omnipresence of the God that we serve. And so when I think about what God has spoken to us over the last seven weeks, when I think about this sermon series that God has has led us through and what has come forth as as a result of this series, I, I have no choice but to conclude. I have no choice but to come to the conclusion that it would be reckless and altogether irresponsible for us to hear the word of God spoken week after week after week after week and not take the time to ask the question, God, why this and why now? It would be reckless of us. It would would be irresponsible for us to come week after week to get fed the word of God. To never stop and ask the question, God, why this, why now? I've said many times before that my children know what time of day it is without ever looking out the window simply based off of what we're feeding them. That what we're feeding them at the table will give them an idea of what's happening outside. 
So it's imperative that we ask the question. It's imperative that we stop to consider, God, what is this kingdom culture series about? And, and what do we need to understand and, and comprehend as we leave 2023 and enter 2024? You see, as much as I love the, the benefits and the value and the advancements of technology, and in no way am I asking to, to revert back to the 80s and and the 90s, the nostalgia of going to Blockbuster on a Friday night with my pops will always have a special place in my heart. But in no way do I miss VHS tapes and, and Nintendo cartridges. I thought I was the baddest man on the planet when mama finally bought me a pager. And I'm in 11th grade and 12th grade with, with the pager. But by no means do I want to go back to the days of the 80s in the 90s, let's keep the past in the past. And, and while I acknowledge and, and love some of the attributes and the advancements of technology, what technology has also done is it's allowed us the opportunity for us to overindulge in the word of God. And there are many, there are many among us that have become gluttonous on sermons and studies and prophetic words and teachings and conferences and summits and, and camps. And you may be sitting there saying, Pastor, how is that, how is that even possible? That, that doesn't even make sense. At, at first you say we don't read and, and study enough, and now you're saying we, we overindulge in the word of God. Make up your mind. Wh which one is it? Reminded of what David said in Psalms 119, he says, thy word have I hidden in my heart. David says, my word have I hid in my heart that, that I might not sin against thee. And what that lets me know is that David wasn't concerned about head knowledge. He wasn't concerned about how much he could consume for the sake of looking or sounding a certain way in front of others. It wasn't a matter of head knowledge to him, it was a matter of his heart. Listen, there's a reason why, there's a reason why the Bible says in James, the first chapter, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness and implanted word, which is able to save your souls. This is what the Bible says. It says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, look at what the Bible says. It says, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. As believers and as followers of Jesus the Christ, we have to know that there is a difference between consumption and compliance. I'll say it again, as believers, as, as blood-washed, born-again believers, as followers of Jesus the Christ, we have to know that there is a difference between consumption and compliance. And what I mean by that is this, what, what I mean by that is this, is that there are many who are nothing but consumers of God's word. And the problem isn't so much with their consumption, although that can be a problem based off of who's, whose table you're eating from. But that's another story for another day. The real problem lies in their lack of obedience in what they consume. The problem isn't that you're consuming so much. The problem is that you're not obedient to that which you have consumed. Technology has afforded us and endless stream of prophetic word. Anybody you want to follow, you can follow. Any prophetic word you want to hear on any, on any subject, you can go and follow and, and find somebody that's speaking on it. There's sermons on every topic under the sun. There's messages on healing and deliverance and fasting and praying. There's in-depth teachings on visions and dreams. Anything that you want to find through technology, you can find. But what happens is we sit and we consume and consume and consume and consume. And naturally, naturally we know what happens when we overeat and fail to exercise. 
Naturally, we all understand what happens when we eat and eat and eat and we fail to exercise. There are consequences. Consumption without exercise in the natural leads to obesity. Consumption without exercise in the natural leads to heart disease and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and stroke and type 2 diabetes. When we overeat and we don't exercise, there are consequences for our actions. There are consequences for eating without exercising in the natural realm. Then why wouldn't we think that there are consequences when we overeat without exercising in the spirit realm? And there are many, there are many who show up faithfully to all of the things. Every function they're there. Every Bible study, every prayer meeting, every, every activity outside of the church, every Sunday service, they're there, they're there, they're there, they're consuming and consuming and consuming. We have it and they show, we have it and they show and they're faithful to show up. And they can't understand why their lives are riddled with spiritual disease. Can't understand why I'm suffering through some of the things that I'm suffering through. I don't understand. I show up and I consume. All I do is indulge. God, all I do is listen. All I do is consume, consume. Why is my life looking the way it's looking, God? And at some point, we have to stop and ask ourselves, is it my diet that's killing me? Or is it my lack of exercise? Is it my diet that's killing me, that's causing the problems that I'm having? If all I consume is the word of God, then it can't be my consumption. Or is it my lack of exercise? Have I consumed so much and failed to apply, or failed to comply, failed to obey the word of God, but I continue to show as a pastor of this church, my sole concern can't lie with how many people are coming to eat on Sunday. As a pastor of this church, my sole focus cannot be on how many people are showing up to eat on Sunday. My primary concern can't lie in creating strategy that attracts more and more people to come eat at the table, to feed my feeble ego. My primary concern can't lie in creating strategy to figure out how many more people will show up to Monday night prayer or, or to Thursday night Bible study. I, I, that cannot be my primary concern or focus. Is it important? Absolutely. As a team, do we need to stop and consider where do we need to pivot? What do we need to change? How can we draw more people in? But that cannot be my sole focus. We don't simply glorify God by what we eat. I don't simply go glorify God by what I consume. We do so by allowing what we eat to change the very nature of who we are. How do I glorify God? I consume his word, and then I allow it to change my heart. I allow it to change my mind. I allow it to change my habits and behaviors and conditions and where I go and who I go with and who I hang around. And through that, God is glorified. And that's how you run into people 10 and 20 years later, and they say, man, you, you're looking good, Eddie. Man, I ain't seen you in a long time. Man, you look, you look better than you did when we were hanging out when we were younger reason why people can say that is because I'm not just a consumer of God's word, but it's been exercised in my life. What you're seeing is the result of me consuming God's word and then exercising it in my life. And sometimes I get it wrong and I don't have it all figured out. But God, if I continue to consume and apply, consume and apply, God, before you know it, I won't even know the version of the man that I was looking at in the mirror. That's what the Bible is talking about in James. That you want to be a hearer of God's word and consume and consume. But you're not a doer. You forgot what you look like. But oh, the one that puts in the work to exercise. Oh, the one that's put in some sweat equity. Oh, the one that says, I don't feel like showing up, but I'm going to show up anyway. I'm going to apply myself anyway. Oh, the one that says, I'm not going to respond the way that I want to respond in this moment. 
Yeah, those are the ones that years from now you will bump into some folks that you used to run with. Man, is that you? I could hardly even recognize you. And they look like they've aged. And life has taken a toll on them. And you look like the word of God has been applied to your life. You see, the truth is that there are a lot of people that are looking for a new word for the new year. The truth is that a lot of people, and Rudy, I saw you, I saw your post on Instagram talking about the same thing. There are a lot of people that are looking for a new word for the new year. This will be the year of fill in the blank. And I get it, and I'm not mocking it. In fact, 2023 for the gathering church was a year of hope. And so I'm not, I'm not knocking the idea of this thing, but there are a lot of people that are looking for a new word for the new year. This will be the year of growth. This will be the year of prosperity. This will be the year of peace. This will be the year of favor. This will be the year of abundance. It'll be the year of goodness. Just fill in the blank and it'll be. And my problem with that is that most people, not all, but most people are looking for a new word for the new year when the reality is that they haven't even been obedient to the old word from last year. And I'm so ready to cling on to something new when I haven't even been obedient to what God told me to do in 2023. And we're so focused. We're so focused on what this new word will be that we neglect and disregard what God has already said. And we fail to realize that our success in the new season is totally dependent on how obedient we are in the previous season. My success in the season that I'm about to walk into is contingent on my obedience in the previous season. Again, my success in the year, in the season that I'm about to walk into is contingent on how obedient I was in the last one. I don't get to neglect God in the winter, but expect to blossom in the spring. I don't, I don't get to neglect the instruction to sow, but I'm, I've got my hand out looking for a harvest. I don't get to neglect the season of prayer and intercession and fasting at the feet of Jesus, but I expect to walk into a season of breakthrough. No, 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 no. The season that you're about to walk into will be a direct reflection of your obedience in that one. to not I don't get to not fast and pray and sacrifice and go before God and learn how to pray and learn how to listen and learn how to listen to the voice of God but then enter into a season and expect a handout and just call it the year of breakthrough because that sounds good this year it's not how it works that's not how it works but it's how so many people live. And it's the catalyst for why so many people are frustrated with God. This perspective and mindset is the very reason why so many people are angry with God and they've given up on the church and they've given up on relationship and they've given up on Christ and they've given up on reading the word. And the truth is that the only person that they can be frustrated and mad with is themselves. And so before we go off, in search of a new word. Before we go off trying to cling to something new, looking to consume more and more and more, we've got to be willing to take an inventory of what we did with the last word. God, what did I do with the seeds that you gave me in the last season? Because I can't expect it to sprout in this one if I didn't plant it and water and I didn't steward it the way that you called me to. And we're so ready to cling on to what 2024 will be. And Instagram is just popping up with prophetic words for the New Year's. And I get it, and I'm not shaming some of that stuff. But how many of us have been obedient to the old one? Or we're looking to just cling to something new. And I said earlier, 
we spent the last seven weeks submerged in this conversation of kingdom culture. And as I began to seek the Lord about how we were going to close out this series and what God wanted to say to his people, I kept coming back to this image and the expectation of how royalty is required to dress. As I thought about how God wanted to close out this season, I kept going back to this image of how royalty is required to dress. And it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. You could be in the United Kingdom. You could be in Great Britain. You could be in Africa. You could be in Asia. You can always distinguish royalty based off of how they're dressed. You can always distinguish royalty based off of how they're dressed. Their attire, what they put on, the way in which it's worn sets them apart from everybody else. And I couldn't help but to think that if that's true in the natural sense, if it's true in the natural realm, then it certainly has to apply in the spiritual. And so as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, as citizens of the kingdom of God, as, as heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ and being grafted and adopted into God's family. I have to know that there is then an obligation to know how I'm required to dress. That if I'm grafted into the royal family of God, if I'm an heir with God and a co-heir with Christ, as so says my Bible, then there's an obligation for me to know how I'm required to dress. From this place, that you realize that it's not just my association that grants me access to the kingdom, but it's my attire as well. That it's not just my association that, that gets me through the gates, but it's my attire as well. In fact, my attire, my attire, it's my attire that introduces me before I ever even open my mouth to speak. My attire introduces me before I ever open my mouth to speak. Some of us, some of us could do a lot less talking if we dressed accordingly and allowed our attire to speak on our behalf. You wouldn't have to run your mouth so much if you just dressed accordingly and allowed the attire of God to speak on your behalf. It isn't just my association that grants me access to the kingdom, but it's my attire as well. I can't just show up any old kind of way and expect to get in. There are standards that must be kept. And my lack of agreement, you have to hear this, my lack of agreement with the standards doesn't make me exempt from keeping them. The fact that I don't like all of the standards doesn't mean that I'm immune or exempt from keeping them. And what so many of us have done is we've asked God to be a part of his kingdom on the condition that we can dress however we want. God, I'll be a part of this kingdom of yours. But my attire, the way that I present myself, I leave that up to me. And that's not how the kingdom of God works. A simple Google search will list off several requirements and traditions that the British royal family must honor when it comes to their title to their attire. If you if you want to be a part of if you want to be associated with this kingdom, then there are some traditions and requirements that you are obligated to follow. Man, you can only have a beard when, when you're serving in the army or if you're on extended leave or, or hunting out in the wilderness. Other than that, when you come back to the palace, the beard has to go. Black can only be worn when we're mourning. Boys can't wear pants until they've, until they've reached a certain age, and so they can only wear shorts. The queen has to approve the wedding dress for everybody in the royal family. Women are required to wear hats to formal occasions, and the list goes on and on and on with traditions and requirements that the royal family is expected to honor. And their unwillingness, their unwillingness to do so regardless of their bloodline. I don't care who your daddy was. I, I don't care who your mom was in the line of, of queens. Their unwillingness to do so isn't met with negotiations from the sovereign. 
their unwillingness to comply with the requirements and traditions of the royal family isn't met with negotiations from the king and queen. No, 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 there is no room for arbitration. There is no room for mediation with the king. The rules are the rules. And their unwillingness to oblige ultimately compromises their seat in the kingdom. Your unwillingness to oblige with the requirements of the royal family doesn't give you a seat in front of the king to negotiate. No, 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 you just compromise your position in the kingdom. And if that's the case in the natural, if that's the case in the natural realm, then how much more should we expect our sovereign? to keep the same requirements in the spiritual. And so there's a reason why, and we talked about this last week, but there's a reason why Jesus said in Luke 14, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it. You see, everybody wants the perks of the kingdom. Everybody wants the benefits of the kingdom. Everybody wants to be labeled royal. Every, everybody wants what comes, what comes with being a part of the royal family, but very few have stopped to count the cost. So what does the Bible say about how we're to dress as citizens of the kingdom of God? What does the Bible have to say about, about my attire? I want to draw your attention to the book of Colossians, the third chapter. Where the Bible gives us specific instructions on how, on how we're to dress. And the reason why we have to pay attention to this, the reason why it's imperative that we know this is because the way that I dress is a reflection of where I come from. The way that I dress is a reflection of where I come from. And what happens is we run the risk of misrepresenting God when we are disregarding his dress code. I run the risk of misrepresenting God. And so the Bible says in the book of Colossians, the third chapter, and it should be on the screen behind us. The Bible says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the, on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ whose life, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now listen to what the Bible says. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Or in other words, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked in when you lived in them. But here's what the Bible says about how we're to dress. But now you yourselves are to put off. To put off simply means to rid oneself or, or to take off. The Bible says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds, since you have taken off the old man with his deeds and have put on a new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Jew nor J Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Cisathian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. Now the Bible is telling us how to dress, what to put on. To put on simply means to dress oneself in or to make part of one's appearance or behavior. God, it says, now I'm, now I'm telling you how to dress. Now, now I'm telling you what to put on. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. You want to know how to dress? God says, put on some tender mercies. Kindness and humility, meekness and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all things, put on love. God says, if you're going to walk out of the house and put on anything, put on some love. Which is the bond of perfection. 
and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in your word, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We live in a world, we live in a world where, in large part, people get dressed based solely off of how they feel. Dash and I went to a funeral a few weeks ago, and I was in utter shock of how people dress. At a funeral, people no longer show up dressed based on the magnitude of the event that they're attending. That's no longer the driver or what informs how people dress. They show up based solely off of how they feel. And I've been in environments where the way that somebody dressed was an indication of they wanted to let you know how they felt based off of how they were dressed. This is my don't bother me outfit. My leave me alone, don't say a word to me outfit in the morning. This is my I haven't had my second cup of coffee outfit. You bet not say a word to me. People show up to work dressed based on how they feel. They show up to weddings and funerals and special occasions dressed solely based on how they feel. And what's happened as a result of that is we have become accustomed based off of the world's culture to showing up not based on expectation but based off of how I feel. I show up based off of how I feel. But then I think about kingdom culture. I think about kingdom culture, which says to put on tender mercies, put on kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Nowhere in the kingdom culture does my feelings get to drive or dictate how I show up. Nowhere in kingdom culture does does how I feel or what I've been through or what I just had to deal with get to inform how I show up. I don't show up based on how I feel. I show up based on my relationship with my sovereign. My feelings don't dictate how I show up. My fellowship with my sovereign dictates how I show up. Feelings isn't the driver. Feelings isn't the informer of of how I show up, how I represent myself. My fellowship with my sovereign does. And if you want proof of this, if you want proof of this in example, if you want it exemplified, all you have to do is study the life of Jesus Christ. At a point where he would have been more justified than anybody else in taking off kindness and taking off humility and taking off meekness when he was suspended between heaven and earth. If there was ever a time when somebody could have taken off love, when somebody could have taken off meekness, could have taken off kindness, it was when he was suspended in between heaven and earth. When he could have responded and said, don't you know at any given time I could call 12 legions of angels to respond. At any given moment he could have responded and said, God, I'm I'm taking this love thing off. I'm taking this long-suffering thing off. God, I'm responding based off of how I feel because they did me wrong. If anybody had an obligation or, or a right to respond differently, it was Jesus the Christ. And the reason that he didn't is because Jesus understood that his location didn't change his position. He understood that whether I was riding in to Jerusalem on a donkey or I'm coming back on a white horse, still represents royalty. Jesus understood that whether I'm seated on the right hand side of God or I'm nailed to an old rugged cross, that I still represent royalty. He understood that if I was wearing some garments that have been handed down to me, 
or I'm wearing the garments as I'm seated next to my heavenly father, I know that I represent royalty regardless of where I am. Jesus understood that regardless of where I go, I'm dressed for the occasion. I understand what kingdom culture is. I, I understand the requirement to dress a certain way. I, I know that, that, that the word of God says to put on meekness. First, I got to take off wrath. First, I've got to take off malice. First, I've I got to take off a lying tongue, and I've got to take off a foul mouth. There are some things that I've got to get rid of. Jesus understood that regardless of where I am, I represent royalty. That whether I'm riding in on a donkey or I'm riding in on a white horse, I'm representing royalty. He understood that regardless of where I go, I'm dressed for the occasion. And my feelings, my feelings don't dictate how I show up. I need you to know that God is concerned about how you're dressed. God is concerned about how you're showing up. God is concerned about how you're representing royalty. There's a standard. I need you to know that there's a standard that we're obligated to uphold. And, and we don't just get to show up any old kind of way based off of how we feel. God says that there are certain things that, that I require you to take off. And what we have to understand about God, listen to this, and I'm going to take my seat, is what we have to understand about God is that he won't dress you where you can dress yourself. God won't dress you where you can dress yourself. Notice the language that Paul uses in Colossians. He, he says four things. Paul says four things, and he's specific in who the ownership and the responsibility lies on. Listen to it. Paul is specific. There's four things he says, and he's specific in who the ownership and the responsibility lies on. First, he says, set your mind. On things above, not on things on the earth. He doesn't say God will come in and set. Paul says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. The second thing he says, but now you yourselves, the responsibility lies with you. He says, now you yourselves are to put off all of these. Anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. He didn't say God will, will leave his seat in heaven. He didn't say that, that Jesus will leave his perfect seat in, in heaven and get you to do this. He says, but now you yourselves ought to take off some things. Third thing that Paul says is to put on tender mercies. Put on kindness. Put on humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Paul says, that's your responsibility. And God isn't going to dress you where you can dress yourself. And so many of us are frustrated with God because we've been sitting here waiting for God to put something on and to take something off that he's required us to do. And there's some things that are going to happen in the supernatural that only the spirit of God can do absolutely. But God says, there's some things that you've got to do. There's some decisions that you have to make. You've got to be willing to stand. You've got to be willing to say, I, I ain't fooling with them no more. I ain't going over there no more. I ain't putting that in my body no more. Fourth thing Paul says is, but above all these, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Some of us have been waiting for God to dress us. God won't do for you what you can do for yourself. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is how am I leaving the house? We spend so much time getting ready and preparing. And some of us still iron. And I need you to know that God is concerned about how you're dressed. 
And I remember as Samuel was going to Jesse's house, because God had already determined that Saul can no longer hold the position of king. Saul is done with. I'm, I'm done with Saul. I've rejected Saul as king. And as Samuel made his, his way to Jesse's house, and David's older brother came out. Samuel said, surely this is him. He's head and shoulders above the rest. He's, he's more handsome than the rest. He's, he's bigger and stronger than everybody else. What was God's word to Samuel? Man looks at the outward appearance. Man looks at this stuff. Man is, man is influenced and, and flabbergasted by this stuff. God says, I look at your heart. I'm concerned about your heart posture. And God says, when you leave the house in the morning, I'm not concerned about how, how you look to other people. I built you uniquely. Yes, I, I built you with care. I built you with character and, and with style. And, and yes, yes, I love all of that. But God says, I'm more concerned about you putting on some neatness before you leave. Before you show up to the job, I, I need to make sure you put on some humility. Have you, have you, have you forgot your long suffering? Some of us will run back in the house when we've forgotten a piece of clothing. If we forgot to spray a little cologne or, or perfume, we'll run back in the house. I need you to run back in the house to get some long suffering. Don't leave the house without your love. You wonder why you're walking into some of the conditions and predicaments that you found yourself in. It's because you left the house naked. You left the house exposed, and God says, I need you to cover up. Before, above all else, I need you to put on some love. There's some circumstances, there are some situations and some environments that I'm going to need you to go into. And I need you to go in with love. Don't be so concerned about your outward appearance that we leave meekness and long-suffering and joy in our closets at home because it's unimportant to us. God says, I'm concerned about your attire. There's a standard. God says, I need you to know that regardless of where you go, that you represent royalty. That whether Jesus was suspended in between heaven and earth, or seated on the right hand side of the Father, or laying in a tomb for three days, he represented royalty. doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves being as a man that looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets what type of man he is God says I'm telling you this for a reason and while you may not understand it now I need you to go home and make sure that you get this so deep in your heart and in your spirit don't leave the house again without your love don't leave the house again without meekness don't, don't leave the house again without the fruits of the Spirit. Don't be so concerned with how good you look outwardly. But spiritually, you leave yourself exposed. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. God, we thank you for the simplicity of your word this evening, God. I thank you for painting such a clear picture. of the requirements within the kingdom of heaven to dress ourselves appropriately. I pray that we'd be challenged and convicted this evening of the things and the areas of our lives that we still need to take off. There's still some things that we're putting on before we leave the house, God, that you've caused us to discard, that you've called us to get rid of. And I'm going to still carry this filthy mouth because I might need to show up and defend myself. And God says, but I called you to, to put on meekness. And I'm going to put on this pride. Because I'm not going to let anybody just talk to me any old kind of way. And God is saying, but in kingdom culture, I, I just called you to put on some humility. God says there's some things even now and you know exactly what they are. 
It's time to take them off. You've carried them for too long. And God says, you don't even realize it, but it's unnecessary weight. It's things that you've put on from childhood. There's abuse and neglect that I had to deal with. And so, yeah, I'm going to put on this tough exterior because I'm not going to allow anybody else to disrespect me. God says, but I just called you to, to put on some long suffering. God says, above all else, but you don't even realize it, that when you dress the way that, I, that, I, that I've asked you to dress, above all else, to put on love. Why that? God, why love? The Bible declares that God is love. And that he that loveth is born of God. Knoweth not that God is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Which means that when I put on love, when I walk out the house and I, and I put on love, that means that I'm covered in God. That I'm saturated in God. God says that I'm calling you to take some things off for season. There's some things that you've, you've carried for far too long. And I need you to know what it feels like to put on your royal attire. You've dressed like everybody else for far too long. And God says, it's time to put on your royal attire. Because there's work to be done. God, I thank you for the sincerity of your word. I thank you because even now you're penetrating hearts and minds and lives. You're bringing to our memory even now, God, the things and the areas of our lives that you're calling us to 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 take off and through the power of your Holy Spirit you're stripping us of some things God through the power of your Holy Spirit we're removing some things from our lives that are uncharacteristic of who you are for it's not by power and it's not by might but it's by your spirit declares the Lord there's some trauma that you're stripping us of this evening God there's some fear and some disappointment and some failure that we're taking off this evening. There's some addiction that we're taking off this evening. There's a lying tongue that we're taking off this evening. There, there's an addiction to pornography that we're stripping ourselves of this evening. Addiction to fornication we're stripping ourselves of this evening. anger and the jealousy we're stripping ourselves of this evening for too long the enemy has lied and told us in our ears that that's what we need in order to be who we are the word of God declares that if any man be in Christ he is a new creature all things have passed away and behold all things have become new God says I want to introduce you to a new you God says, I want to introduce you to a new you. You will look into the mirror and you won't even recognize yourself anymore because the glory of God is shining on you. God says, there's some things that I've embedded in you that I'm calling forth. And the only way that that can happen is through a stripping. It's through taking some things off. And I know it's uncomfortable. And I know you feel exposed. And I know you haven't felt like this ever before. And I know the enemy is in your ear right now trying to tell you that this foolish pastor is lying to you. But I declare by the power of the living God that if you would allow God to begin to strip you of some things, you will walk into a season of life that you never thought possible. You will see God begin to open doors that you never thought possible because you're dressed in your royal attire. God says you're dressed for the occasion and I can let you in. Devil, I bind you in the mighty name of Jesus. You have no authority over these people. You have no authority. I cancel every assignment, every demonic spirit, Every stronghold, 
be it cast down now in the mighty name of Jesus. God said, and even now, scales are falling. God said, even now, ears are being opened. And if there's a level of sincerity and purity in this moment, where the spirit of the living God can speak and you hear, done now, God, according to your will and according to your word, seal it as only you can. That you would be glorified. That above all else, God, you would be glorified. That our lights would shine before men, that they would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. God, none of the praise belongs to us. It all belongs to you. So, God, we magnify you. God, we glorify you. God, we exalt you. We lift you up, God, above every problem, every trial, every situation. God, there's none greater. There is none wiser. There is none bigger. You are Alpha and Omega. You all else should die, God. You're all sufficient. There is none like you. You consume the heavens and the earth. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are, God, and we worship you as such. We magnify you. I seal your word. And I thank you now. I can see your children dressed in their royal attire. No longer bound to what they used to be. God, that they would be released from the stronghold of the memory of what they used to be. That the chains of what they used to do would be broken in the mighty name of Jesus. They would see themselves as a part of your royal kingdom. God, and we'll be so careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen.